Here at Marquette University, we have so many amazing scholars researching, writing, and teaching about gender issues. And these gender scholars work in a wide range of areas and disciplines from across our campus. Recognizing this, the Institute for Women's Leadership is excited to announce the launch of our Research Spotlight series. Our goal for the series is to highlight some of the wonderful gender-related research being done on campus and with partners beyond its borders. Each month, we will showcase one scholar in a recorded video discussion. And during these discussions, we will hear about their research and the sometimes personal stories that led to it. I think you'll find these conversations as enlightening as I did, and I do hope that you'll tune in. All right, well, hello everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Research Spotlight series hosted by the Institute for Women's Leadership. Our goal for the series is to shine a light on some of the phenomenal gender scholars at Marquette University and the incredible work that they're doing. I'm Dr. Jenica Webster, co-director of the Institute and associate professor in the College of Business. Today we have with us Dr. Karen Robinson, um, associate professor and director of the Nurse Midwifery Program uh, in the College of Nursing at Marquette. And today she's going to share with us some of her research in the area of racial disparities in healthcare, and specifically uh, when it comes to mothers and children. So, so welcome, Karen. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, of course. So, so before we dive into your research today, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, well, um, I am originally from Gary, Indiana, um, and I am a three-time alum here at Marquette. Um, I got my undergraduate, um, my BSN, my master's in nurse midwifery, and my doctorate all here at Marquette. So it's kind of like once I left Indiana, um, I didn't go back, right? <laughs> and so, um, and it, it, it probably was, and I, if in all honesty, it's because of a man, right? It was my husband who I met here at Marquette as well. He's a um, engineer, mechanical engineer. So we met here. Um, we have two children, Joshua and Kendall. Um, and so just like all other parents across, you know, the country, we're, we're doing this virtual learning. So um, I'm blessed because they're old enough where it's like, you guys are independent a little bit here. Um, what else? I enjoy spending time with my family. We are sports people, um, basketball, um, soccer, um, track. I ran track while I was here, so I was a student athlete as well. Um, let's see, I love women's health. I love teaching. Um, I'm trying to learn how to be creative in cooking um, during this pandemic. You know, everybody's trying to find yeah, something. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I we're we're dabbling in into to different types of, of food. So yeah. I think that's oh, fantastic. Good. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. So I'm I'm uh, gonna transition now. I'm I'm really curious about your research and, and really how you came to study this this topic. So can you provide us with with an overview of your research program? Yeah, so um, my research focuses on um, breast health. If I want to have a big umbrella, breast health, and particularly looking at breastfeeding disparities um, among African American women when you compare us to our Caucasian counterparts. And that research evolved through lived experiences. And so as a practicing um, nurse midwife, I noticed, right, as I'm caring for patients, um, you know, we talk about breastfeeding and the importance of uh, breast milk and what things breast milk can provide. And it wasn't until I actually had my own child and had announced to family that I was going to breastfeed that I was met with, oh, you are? You know, really? And it's like, yeah, why wouldn't I, right? And so then it, that led to my dissertation. Like, is it not common for African-American women to breastfeed? Because up until that point, the clientele that I saw were breastfeeding, right? And so as you dive into the literature, you see that there's these huge disparities of breastfeeding initiation rates between African-American women and Caucasian women. And 
with all the benefits that breast milk can provide and knowing that African-American babies are more likely to be born prematurely and prematurity comes with its own health issues and morbidities and that breast milk, right, continuous exclusive breastfeeding can have an impact on those morbidity outcomes, infant mortality outcomes. And so it's like the population that could benefit from breastfeeding the most was breastfeeding the least, right? And these are decades and decades of disparities. And so I, it begs the question, why? Why are we not breastfeeding, right? Yeah. And so you look in the literature and all of the things that I was seeing was very quantitative. It was like, oh, if you're low socioeconomic or education or single, then you're less likely to breastfeed. And it's like, there's got to be something else. And so what was missing was the voices of the women. What is it about breastfeeding that is a barrier to you or why are you not? And so that's what I sought to do. And so I'm really into qualitative um, research, mixed method research to see, do the numbers really match the lived experiences, right? And, or what else is behind those numbers? And so listening to women, and this is early on again in my research, um, that women were saying that there weren't role models. There weren't people that looked like them. You know, if you looked at media, there were no media images of African-American women breastfeeding. It was Caucasian women. And so it's like, that's not something we do, right? And so even if your provider had mentioned it, it was the support or lack of support in the community yeah. that was a barrier yeah. in, the, in the initial beginning, right? Or workplace. If I work in an environment where there is no space for me to breastfeed, to pump, yeah. there is no place for me to store my breast milk, right? Sure. Then I'm not going to do it, right? Or you hear women who have persevered through that and they're, they're, they're pumping in the bathroom stalls or they go out to their car and they pump. And so those kind of barriers were identified through the voices of the women that I was speaking with. And so it just kind of evolved that way. Sure. So just to um, pick up from, from what you were discussing, so what you found is one of the main barriers for women um, in the African-American community to really uh, want to continue to, you know, to breastfeed is, it, was they weren't seeing others like them doing it. So it was other role models like them um, or, or people who, you know, maybe their mothers or their, you know, family members or friends were really not, were not doing that. And so was it almost um, a stigma? So it was almost like, well, if you're doing this, you're a little different or, I mean, how, how um, do you, and, and do you continue to see that today? So, so again, like I said, this was early on in, in my research and it was the, the lack of support. So it wasn't that we didn't know that breast milk was good for our babies. It wasn't that, that women didn't want to even attempt or try, but with a lot of things, if there is not support, right? If you if you don't have in your inner circle that support system to encourage you to you know to help you along, that it makes it difficult for some, right? And so, if it's not something that's a norm, right? Then it's it is kind of hard to get away from that that norm. And if you think about breastfeeding in general, at one point and even still some now breastfeeding in public is seen as not normal so you know as a society we haven't we hadn't normalized breastfeeding right or if you did you do it in in private don't do it in public right and so if you have that nationally now you bring it into your community and it's even more stigmatized or not the norm right that it makes it difficult. And so what we've seen over time, and I've done some research is that peers, having peers that have been successful provides that lack of role model, right? It provides that support. And when I say peers, I mean, not just by race or ethnicity. It has to be 
race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, where you live, income, all of those things, the more we are alike, the more that peer-to-peer role modeling or support is effective. Because me as Dr. Robinson, yes, I'm African-American, but I don't live in the neighborhoods that all my patients lived in, right? And so having that person who can really relate to the barriers that women say that they have, barriers related to their job, barriers related to lack of support or barriers related to whatever, saying, hey, this is how I was able to overcome those obstacles. It makes it more relatable. So we do find and know that peer to peer, true peer to peer counseling is effective in increasing breastfeeding rates for African American women and continuation. Cause it's not just starting, just not initiating, but that continuation. And we see that further gap, the longer out we go with breastfeeding, the wider those gaps are. Wow, that's remarkable. And you know, to, to just sort of pick up, you talked a lot about, you just talked a lot about community and your research has a very strong community focus. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and, and, and the impact that you're having on our community? Yeah, and, and I, to me, community, um, engaged scholarship is not about the impact that I have, right? It's it's that impact that's created by both experts, the academic expert and the community experts coming together and working towards a common goal that really is identified by the community, right? Um, with the passion of the academic person, right? With that knowledge of, you know, how do we get this messaging out? How do we get to um, disseminating and and making people aware of issues in the community? And so, um, you know, I live in one area and I work in another area. I live down in the Kenosha Racine area and I work um, up here in Milwaukee. And so in, in Racine and Kenosha, I've, develop some community relationships with um, community action agencies that work to, like we all are trying to do, decrease and eliminate health disparities in African-American communities. And infant mortality rates in Racine and Kenosha and Milwaukee are horrible, right? That African-American babies die at three and four times the rate of white babies before their first birthdays. And so there's a lot of community outreach agencies, life health, uh, life course initiatives, um, programs. And so working with those programs and really listening to the community and what is needed and what, how can I help? What expertise can I bring? And so, for example, we, before COVID we did, um, I was part of an annual baby expo where um, it was a, a really an expo of all of community resources coming together and everybody having a booth, just offering information to families. And I would hold a breastfeeding workshop and it was nothing formal, right? Because the community does not want to hear me lecture about breastfeeding, but it was more so an open forum for again, those in the community who have been successful in breastfeeding to have a dialogue with those who may be on the fence. And for me to really be that mediator or moderator in between or dispelling any myths or some of those technical questions that folks may have. And we would have conversations that I would bring in models and really saying, showing like your baby's belly is only this big. You don't need all that formula, you know what I mean? And those things and and really having an impact and and having conversations with women afterwards, how can I be a peer counselor? How, you know, do I have to get training for that? And so it's just those intimate conversations and um, community engaged relationships that you build over time. And so um, most recently I've um, reached out to um, Ms. Dalvery 
um, Blackwell. She's the one of the founders of the African American Breastfeeding Network here in Milwaukee, which is a very successful um, grassroots program here in Milwaukee that has been helping um, African American women be um, their own advocates for breastfeeding because this is where my research is going now, is that we see that providers have biases and, and their institutionalized structures, racist structures in place that are barriers to women of color, African-American women that hinder breastfeeding. And so, um, I, that's where my research is heading now. And so looking at how turning the tables now onto the providers, right? Because we've talked about and touched on peer counseling, which is successful, right? But what happens in the hospital? What happens during your prenatal visits that either strengthens your desire to, to breastfeed, that gives you the resources and tools that you need, or what's there that hinders that, right? And so that, that's kind of where I am now with looking at that, that research. So let me ask, have you been able to identify any of those hindrances in, those, in the hospitals that women might face? Have, have you, or are you just in those initial stages of that research and so really hasn't, haven't been able to identify those? Or have you been able to kind of look and see um, and, and look through that lens of, okay, what are those differences? Why is this, you know, occurring? So, um, so yes and, and no, right? So I'm in the, in the earlier stages of this. And, you know, just like with all research, you do kind of a, I did a scope and review of the literature. What's out there? Is anybody looking at this? And what I found was that there are some, there's a little research out there that talks about the perception, right? Of provider support or lack of support. And perceptions from the woman's point of view and from other colleagues' point of view, like um, lactation consultants, how they see primary providers such as midwives or obstetricians, their, their support or lack of support for one group versus another group. And so what I've found is that we as providers don't always have this conversation throughout the prenatal period regarding infant feeding decisions. Um, you know, we may ask at that first visit, how do you plan to feed? Are you going to breast or bottle feed? And I see you shaking your head. You may have had that question. <laughs> and then we check the box and are we, and then sometimes we're done, right? And so it's, it's not this continuity or this continuous dialogue throughout these 40 weeks, right, where we can have an impact, where we can ask questions of women about their infant feeding choice, right? And that we find that if an African-American woman says, I'm going to formula feed, the conversation stops. Whereas if it is a Caucasian woman, that there may be more inquiry throughout that prenatal period about breastfeeding. And so unless the African-American woman brings it up, sure. the conversation doesn't happen. That's a modifiable barrier. We can change that. And it's, you know, it's getting to, well, why don't we, right? And some providers are like, well, the data shows that African-American women don't breastfeed. So it's like, what's the point? Well, that's the very point, right? That is the very point that we take that data that we know, and now we should hone in our efforts to have the discussion, right? I, I ultimately believe the decision is up to that woman and her family, right. but having an informed as providers, that is our key to informed decision-making. And, and women can't do that if we are providers have a biases. If we already see you, I have an African-American patient, I'm not going to talk to her about breastfeeding because they're less likely anyway, right? That's not, that's not how that goes. And when we get into the hospital, after delivery, how often are African-American women 
given formula right away? Is that question asked? Those types of deals, or even if a woman is, is breastfeeding, if there's difficulty, depending on the staffing, is there a lactation consultant there that can help? Is that nurse prepared to, to help? And so we see disparities in referrals and providing resources for African-American women when we compare them to um, our Caucasian counterparts. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. And, and it would definitely have an impact on, on somebody's decision-making process in that stage. So I mean, such remarkable and impressive work. Um, let me, let me ask you, so, you know, you've won several awards for your research, including best paper recognition and a Wallace faculty fellow award. And at the same time, you've also won the American college of nurse midwives excellence in teaching award. So how would you describe your connection between your teaching and your research and vice versa? Oh, I, I think they go, they, they have to go hand in hand. Um, if, if my, one of my roles is to prepare future Marquette nurses, future Marquette nurse midwives who are gonna care for the very women that I'm trying to help, right? that this research has to be infused in everything that we talk about. When we talk about disparities, we don't just talk about the numbers. It's the why behind it. And get, get students to really start to critically think and think outside of themselves about what's going on. Because the, again, these are going to be the providers that are going to care for women who have been underserved for years, right? For decades. And so bringing that research in, bringing in topics and talking about institutionalized racism, talking about bias and talking about an anti-racist um, structures, right? And how those things have an impact on health disparities and health inequities is crucial in, especially in healthcare, I think in any domain, but for me, black women and babies are dying at rates that are unacceptable. And I need, and I'm gonna get emotional, and I need my students to get, to feel, you know, I need them to be upset and angry that we have a group, a population that is, that's not being heard and they're dying because they're not being heard. And so, you know, and so you can hear the passion that, you know, I, I say in class and, and when we talk and I, you know, open up conversations that, hey, if you have a different perspective, let's talk about it. Because I believe we all have biases and I believe that it's important to recognize them and then ask yourself, how have I let or how will I let these biases impact the quality of care that I provide? And if that is a barrier, then we need to start doing some self-reflection and, and working towards um, an unbiased and anti-racist uh, way of providing care. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's remarkable. And, you know, let me also add and, and uh, dive a little deeper. So you, you talked about your research, where it's going and what you've done. Uh, you also talked about one of the uh, findings that you found um, that was helpful is that, that, that peer support was really predictive of whether or not people uh, would breastfeed or not. Are, are there, is there any other surprising or important finding that you, that you, um, uh, that you uncovered throughout your research process that you, would, that you, that, that you found interesting? So um, I also did like a, I shouldn't say like, I did a, a meta-analysis of group prenatal care. So group prenatal care is different than our traditional one-on-one -on -one prenatal care where you see your provider every four weeks and then it's every two weeks and then it goes to every week. Group prenatal care is a group of women who are connected by um, their date of delivery, that they are all due around the same time. So, you know, it can be women from all different socioeconomic statuses that see the same providers or group of providers. And instead of that 15 minute quick 
prenatal visit where we measure belly, listen to the baby. Are you okay? All right, good. These women are in a cohort for two hours at a time. And there are set topics, but the women kind of lead what topic they would like to talk about. In addition to, they are part of that prenatal visit, doing their own urine checks or their own weights and documenting those. So really getting engaged and involved in that prenatal care. And again, creating the support system where you can talk about other things that these social determinants, right? These other things that are happening during this pregnancy that are gonna have an impact, right? And so we found that African-American women who participate in those group prenatal care groups have higher instances or rates of breastfeeding initiation and duration. And again, it has to be, you, we have to think that it's related to this constant support yeah. coupled with education, coupled with seeing role models, right? That builds that, that self-advocacy that this is what I'm gonna do and I am prepared, I have the tools to be successful. And so with that, you know, I, I would like to partner with either a midwifery group in the city to, to start a formal group prenatal program. And so there are some informal programs um, around the city with that midwives do, but a real structured one would be would be awesome. And then the inclusion of doulas who are um, support persons, birth support persons, not healthcare providers, but again, a individualized support person for that woman, for her family, right? That can be another, um, again, another layer of support throughout the pregnancy and then during labor to be, again, another advocate, another support person to, to help with increasing rates of breastfeeding, decreasing rates of preterm labor and infant mortality and, and maternal morbidity. So, um, so yeah, so those are the things that I am, am learning. Um, I'm not surprised that um, there are um, issues of race, racism uh, within the systems that are barriers to, to African-American women and their desire to, to breastfeed. Um, it's not a surprise that, you know, the more support you have, more positive support you have, the better that, that, that desired behavior is able to be carried out, those types of deals. Um, so yeah, so there are some, some new knowledges, but there are other things that are just confirmed and that African-American women, just like women of all races, have a voice and they and they they know their lived experience and we need to make sure that that's coming out in 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 the research that we're doing. Yeah, well it's clear that you're passionate about about this topic and it, and it is such an important topic and I, I you know coming up with an initiative or or a framework to where you can utilize having these these groups and of, of folks coming together to act as peers to act, to really normalize this behavior and to really do all, all those things that you were saying that you found in your research is is remarkable. Um, I just have a couple of more questions for you. So so has your how has your research really had a personal impact on you? Um, I think from that initial inkling that, hey, I want to do research when I got questioned about my infant feeding method, it it be it was personal from the get-go, right? It was it was personal to normalize breastfeeding among African American the American, African American population that it was it was important that women that look like me were informed and had a voice in how they were going to feed their babies and so um you know it's it's just again it's just been this growing passion and it's just again it has spilled over into my teaching because again I'm not practicing. So 
as I prepare those who are going to be practicing, I want them to be prepared and equipped to have conversations with individuals that may not look like them and not make assumptions about, you know, how they're going to feed their babies based off of quantitative data or only, or what they see in the media or whatever the, where they got those resources, but really individualize their approach to each family, especially those from underserved um, populations. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so, so, so much, Karen. It is, it has been such a, you know, a, a nice opportunity to be able to talk with you. Thank you so much today for sharing, for sharing your amazing research and, and important insights. Uh, and thank you for all of, uh, for, for, thank you. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. And we really hope that you keep an eye out for, for our next episode. Thank you for having me, Jenica. Thank uh, you, Karen.